Hi everyone, this lesson is on complex regional pain syndrome. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about some risk factors for getting this condition. We're also going to talk about some of the pathophysiology behind why it occurs. Then we're going to talk about some of the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So complex regional pain syndrome is a neuropathic pain disorder involving long-lasting pain that is out of proportion to the underlying cause. We'll talk a bit more about this later on in this lesson. Now the etiology and risk factors for getting this condition include the following. This condition is often preceded by an injury, fracture, or surgery, but may be spontaneous in some cases. And oftentimes, it's often an injury or a fracture or a surgery to a distal extremity. So oftentimes, the hands or the feet are going to be most often affected. Now for risk factors, it does seem that genetics plays a role as to who gets this condition. And it's believed that certain human leukocyte antigen or HLA alleles play a role in the likelihood age of onset and severity. So certain HLA alleles increase the likelihood of having this condition after a potential injury and also decreases the age of onset. So oftentimes patients will be younger when they do have this condition and the severity is often worse with those patients. Now, although we mentioned that it's preceded by an injury, fracture, or surgery, fractures are going to be the most common etiology. And it's oftentimes going to be a fracture of the upper extremity. So the hand, the wrist, or the forearm. So those are often going to be some of the most common areas that are going to be affected. And then the mean age of onset of this condition is often going to be later on in life, oftentimes between the fourth to seventh decade of life. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology behind this condition. There are multiple mechanisms that explain a pain dysregulation. So the central point of this condition is that there is pain dysregulation, but there are multiple mechanisms that may explain this. One is inflammatory changes. So it has been found that there are elevated pro-inflammatory cytokines in complex regional pain syndrome patients. The elevated pro-inflammatory cytokines include TNF-alpha, interleukin-2, and interleukin-6. And then there's also been found that there are elevated neuropeptides. And these elevated neuropeptides include bradykinin, substance P, and calcitonin gene-related peptide, or CGRP. So these cytokines and neuropeptides appear to cause vasodilation and appear to lead to an inflammatory state within the affected area. The second proposed mechanism is immunological changes. So it's believed that autoantibodies may be produced against certain receptors, and these include beta-2 adrenergic receptor, alpha-1 adrenergic receptor, and muscarinic-2 receptor. So these receptors are part of the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. And then another mechanism is pain sensitization. This is going to be a very important one. So Oftentimes, those pro-inflammatory cytokines we talked about before, they can reduce the pain threshold in peripheral nerves. This is what we would call peripheral sensitization. And then elevated neuropeptides we talked about before, bradykinin and substance P, for instance, they can act on dorsal horn neurons within the spine to make those neurons more sensitive. So this is what we would call central sensitization. So both of these, peripheral sensitization and central sensitization, ultimately due to those inflammatory changes we talked about before, they can lead to increased pain sensitivity, and that's going to be a very key hallmark of this condition. And then it's also been noted that there is autonomic dysregulation in this condition. So certain pain neurons exhibit increased numbers of sympathetic receptors. So this is also another key point to make with regards to the pathophysiology behind this condition. And oftentimes this may explain why certain stressors can worsen the pain experience for these patients. So if there is stress and there's catecholamine release, those catecholamines can act on sympathetic receptors to worsen the pain experience of the patient. So this is another reason why we can see this occurring in this condition. Now, before we get into the signs and symptoms, let's talk about the types of complex regional pain syndrome. There are actually two main types. Type 1, which was formerly known as reflex sympathetic dystrophy. This is where it occurs without peripheral nerve damage. So it's usually a milder or minor injury that leads to this condition. So if there's a minor injury, no peripheral nerve damage, and there is complex regional pain syndrome, that would be type 1. And then type 2, which is formerly known as costalgia, this occurs in the context of damage or trauma to peripheral nerves. So this would be in a case of a more severe injury. So these are the two main types of this condition. 
but both have similar clinical presentations. So although we may name them type 1 or type 2, they both have similar clinical presentations. There are two subtypes of this condition, which we won't get into much in this lesson. One is known as warm complex regional pain syndrome. This is where abnormal vasodilation occurs. And then there's cold complex regional pain syndrome where abnormal vasodilation does not occur. So these are two subtypes that you may see when looking at literature on this condition. But the main points I want you to take away from this slide are the two main types, type 1 and type 2. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of complex regional pain syndrome. As its name implies, there is going to be an issue with pain. And this pain is going to occur within a region. So complex regional pain syndrome, the pain is going to occur within a region. It's not going to be confined to a particular dermatome. It's going to be in a certain region. And the pain in this condition is going to be long lasting and continuous. So it's going to last longer than it should. This is going to be a hallmark finding in this condition. There are other important characteristics of this pain. One of those characteristics is that there is hyperalgesia. So hyperalgesia is a pain that is disproportionate to the underlying injury. So even if there's a small minor injury, there can be hyperalgesia. Hyperalgesia would be when you try to provoke pain in that area, that affected area. So you might try to poke it with something or try to provoke pain with a painful stimuli. And the pain is going to be out of proportion to what it should. That would be hyperalgesia. So there's going to be an exaggerated pain response. Allodynia is also another finding that we can see with this condition. So in the affected area, whether that be a hand or a foot or a forearm, pain can be elicited in that affected area by a stimuli that should not cause pain. So if you were to just gently touch the area, that may cause pain. That would be allodynia. So it shouldn't cause pain, but it does. That is allodynia. And this is going to be due to some of that sensitization that we talked about earlier. And then because of this pain in the affected area with hyperalgesia and allodynia, we can see functional impairment. So oftentimes, the functional impairment is going to lead to weakness and a reduced ability for motion. So there's oftentimes reduced range of motion in a particular area that is affected. There are some other important signs and symptoms of this condition. Some of them include erythema and edema. So erythema is a redness or reddened area. So the site becomes reddened. That's oftentimes going to be due to that vasodilation we talked about before. And then edema can also occur that is swelling in the area. So along with that pain that we talked about before, the area can become reddened and swollen. Hyperhidrosis can also occur in this area. So hyperhidrosis is excessive sweating. So that affected area can sweat more than it should. And this is going to be part of that autonomic dysregulation we talked about before. Patients will often have issues with sleep disruption as well from this condition. You can imagine that if you're having ongoing pain with allodynia, hyperalgesia, it's going to cause issues with your sleep. There are important dermatological findings as well with this condition. These include hair thinning or complete loss of hair in the affected area. So in this image here, you can see this is the lower leg, and this can happen in complex regional pain syndrome. The area can be very painful, have long-lasting, ongoing pain, and then that area can also have thinning of the hair or a complete loss of hair as well. There can also be skin thickening in the area, and there can also be nail changes, either thickening or thinning of the nail if the hands or feet are affected. So those are going to be the hallmark findings with regards to complex regional pain syndrome, but there can be some associations with other conditions as well. So individuals who do have issues with complex regional pain syndrome can often have worsening of underlying depression and anxiety if they are present. So if they do have depression and anxiety and they happen to develop complex regional pain syndrome, that will worsen their depression and anxiety. And you can imagine that it is likely due to the ongoing pain they're experiencing, the loss of function they're experiencing, and the decreased quality of life they're experiencing. And then there's some other symptoms as well that can occur. These include constitutional symptoms like lethargy and even chest pain. So there are many different signs and symptoms that can be associated with this condition. When a patient does get this condition, oftentimes the symptoms can last for a very long time. They may last for a year or more. So very important to recognize this condition. How is complex regional pain syndrome diagnosed? The diagnosis is oftentimes going to be by Budapest criteria. So the Budapest criteria is going to involve patient report and 
physical examination. So criteria A of the Budapest criteria, the patient is going to have continuing pain that is out of proportion to the causative event. So that's going to be one criteria that needs to be met. The patient's also going to report at least one symptom in three of the four following domains. Either they report a symptom in the sensory domain, which they may report hyperalgesia and or allodynia. They may report something within the vasomotor domain, so they may report issues with temperature asymmetry, skin color changes, or skin color asymmetry. There may be signs and symptoms of edema or abnormal sweating. And then the patient may also report signs and symptoms of decreased range of motion, motor dysfunction or weakness, and trophic changes like hair loss. So those are going to be what the patient reports, and they have to have at least one symptom in three of the four domains. And criteria C is often going to be something that is determined by the clinician. So with regards to criteria C, there's evidence of at least one sign in two or more of the following domains, hyperalgesia and or allodynia on exam, temperature asymmetry and or skin abnormalities that are demonstrated, visible edema or sweating changes, and evidence of decreased range of motion or motor dysfunction. So you can see that criteria B is what the patient reports, criteria C is what the clinician is going to examine and gather for evidence. And then criteria D is that there is no better diagnosis for the signs and symptoms that a patient may be experiencing. So oftentimes this is going to be clinically diagnosed with the Budapest criteria, but the diagnosis may be aided by the following. It can be aided by differential neural blockade and a three-phase bone scan. So these tests can also aid in the diagnosis of this condition. So how do clinicians treat this condition? Oftentimes there's going to be methods for trying to prevent this condition from occurring in the first place. So prevention through early mobilization after an injury can be very important. If a patient does get this condition, they may improve spontaneously, although a lot of times they may require help with pain control and improving functionality. Supplementation with vitamin C is important as it may prevent complex regional pain syndrome from occurring in the first place or improve recovery. And smoking cessation also reduces the risk of complex regional pain syndrome. So these are a few things that can be employed in order to help prevent or reduce the risk of having this condition in the first place. With regards to some other treatment modalities that can be employed for patients that do have this condition, some of these include physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and exercise to aid in functioning. Patient education can also be important, so educating the patient about pain and why pain occurs can often help the patient experience the pain differently. And then pharmacotherapy can also be employed, so NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, so ibuprofen can help. Topical capsaicin can also be used, and bisphosphonates can also be used as well. These have been found to reduce the pain in this condition. Gabapentin and amitriptyline have also been used. They may reduce the pain, but there is low quality evidence for their use. And then there's some other therapies that can also be utilized as well, and these include spinal cord stimulation and dorsal root ganglion stimulation as well. These are newer modalities that seem to help reduce the pain that patients experience from this condition. If you want to learn about arthritis and other rheumatological conditions, please check out my rheumatology playlist. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.